Hey everybody, ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Minchef here. Uh, with the drought update this week, we're going to talk about some urban forestry, the importance of trees, right? It's something maybe we don't often think about. Trees are just there, but actually they're quite important to our local ecosystems. Uh, looking at the drought monitor, really things have not changed all that much. Just a couple fractions of a percent here and there, uh, but still 68% of the state in no drought at all. And then that abnormally dry yellow color, about 25% of the state also not technically drought. That is recovering drought. So uh, not not really any changes to the map, but that's not for better or worse at all, right? So just keeping with the status quo. Month is May now, so as we look at the precip tracker, rainfall for this month in downtown Sacramento, about three tenths of an inch. That's a little bit above the average to date, which is about two tenths of an inch. So again, we're just slightly above our normal for the month of May in downtown Sacramento. Uh, as we talk about the season as a whole, this has been true for really all of the water years since November. Uh, we are above our average to date by about eight inches. It's been a particularly wet winter. That's not only true for Sacramento, but across much of the state of California as well. So since October 1st, that start of the water year, here are those precipitation totals that we've seen. This is liquid water equivalent. So like South Lake Tahoe hasn't all fallen as rain, obviously, uh, but that's been 34 about 34 and a half inches of liquid water equivalent. Sacramento has seen about 26 inches total. Stockton, 23 inches. San Francisco, about 31 inches total. Even down in Southern California, LA, about 23 inches. San Diego, about 13 inches. When we look at the next set of data here, all the blue numbers, that's how far above average we are in these particular locations. Los Angeles, a foot of rain above where they normally are to this point in the water year. Palm Springs a little bit below, but it's only even about a quarter of an inch below. So really, the entire state of California has had a wet winter, and that is good news. Uh, we see that on the drought monitor, and it's also good news uh, with regards to our water as well, especially in the reservoirs. So look at Shasta, 98% capacity, 116% of that average today. Oroville, 94% capacity, 121% of that average today. And then Folsom, 85% capacity, 113% of the average today. New Maloney's, Don Pedro, uh, both above 65% above that capacity and the average today is just about at or above 100%. San Luis is an off stream reservoir. Everything in here is pumped, but still we've been able to fill it, right? 99% capacity and 124% of the average to date. I do want to just say something real fast about the waters here, not only in reservoirs, but really in streams as well in the rivers. I know that things are going to start to be warming up here, but the water is still very cold. In fact, it's usually warmer right now in the San Francisco Bay and in the Pacific than it is in a lot of our rivers and streams here locally in the valley. So again, to put that another way, it's colder in the rivers than it is in parts of the Pacific off the coast of the Golden Gate. So just keep that in mind. It's not a really good situation to be swimming in right now because it's cold and it's fast as well. Even if you're a strong swimmer, those can be a dangerous combination. Looking at snowpack, 258% of that average to date in the Northern Sierra, 295% average to date in the Central Sierra. And then look at this number, 401% <laughs> of the average to date in the Southern Sierra. That number has gone up. In fact, all these numbers really continue to go up because we're keeping that snowpack around, right? As we get later on in the summer, when we start to see that snowpack melt off, obviously uh, we typically have less snow up in the Sierra. So what we notice is the April 1st average keeps ticking down, right? These numbers were up above 200% for the most part, even higher down in the Southern Sierra of that April 1st average. But since we're getting later on in the year and we're warming up and we're losing that snow, the average typically drops off pretty quickly, right? But we're kind of keeping some of the snow around. So these averages to date are getting kind of further apart. They are getting bigger as to date, that doesn't mean the snowpack itself or doesn't mean we're continuing to add to it, if, if that makes sense, right? It's kind of just the way the numbers work, that the way the math works as well, that it's 400% average to date doesn't mean we've added more snow. It just means we're keeping that snow around as we start to warm up. And this is important because as we look at the six to 10 day climate outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, this is for temperature. So these dates here would be May 13th through 17th. Look at this, especially in the Pacific Northwest, very likely warmer than average that though extends down into California as well. Really, the only area that we saw that was going to be uh, expected to be cooler than average was down in the state of Texas. Everywhere else basically going to be much hotter than normal. 
and we can see that uh, contour extends down into California. Now, when we talk about precipitation for the next six to 10 days, six to 10 day outlook, that's May 13th through 17th, very likely wetter down in the Southwest for Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of West Texas as well. But then as we talk about uh, California, maybe a little wetter down in the Southern California area, but Northern California up into Oregon, Pacific Northwest, about average and then drier than average uh, as we look at the kind of upper mountains region of the Rockies, right? Idaho, Wyoming, Montana. Uh, so obviously we are, we know this, right? We're entering the drier season at this point, but we do still have some rain out there, maybe some rain chances down for Southern California as well, right? We've had some showers up in Northern California uh, to start this work week. But again, that pattern is changing. Average high 80 to 81 degrees by the end of this week. This is for Sacramento. Look at the forecast high temperatures in the middle 90s for Mother's Day weekend. That is 10 to 15 degrees above our average high for this time of year. And, you know, obviously we are starting to warm up. But again, the average is 80. We're going to be up in those middle 90s. Now, one of the things uh, that, you know, really helps to cool us off when it's hot is the shade from trees, right? But Trees provide a lot for not just the global eco uh, ecosystem, right, but also the local ecosystem. Uh, and they're very important for animals, wildlife, and also people as well. So for Sacramento, uh, this data comes from Climate Central, really great website. Uh, highly recommend going to check them out if you want to learn more uh, about climate or just want to see some uh, nice graphics like this, talking about different aspects of climate and climate change, right? Uh, they're a great organization, highly recommend them. But uh, with the power of trees specifically, with Sacramento, right? One of the things the trees do is they help prevent storm runoff. When we have trees with these roots in the ground, right, uh, they help to absorb some of that water, right? They help to keep pulling that out so that the water can soak back in when we get these rainfall events and it's not just rushing off, uh, you know, go down into the valley or out in towards the Delta area, creating flooding. So that really helps with that. 39 million gallons is how much storm runoff has been avoided uh, with trees in Sacramento. Now, it also helps to remove a million pounds of air pollution. Uh, these trees do, and that's 100,000 tons of CO2. That's that carbon pollution removed. That's just in Sacramento. We can look at other cities too. Here's San Francisco, 90 million gallons of storm runoff avoided, 200,000 pounds of air pollution absorbed, right? Down a little further in the state, Los Angeles, 848 million gallons of storm runoff avoided thanks to the power of trees, right? And just having these trees in urban areas, 14 million pounds of air pollution absorbed, 600,000 tons of CO2 removed thanks to these trees. Here's San Diego, 18 million gallons of storm runoff avoided, 3 million pounds of air pollution absorbed. But it's not just a California thing, not just a West Coast thing. Everybody can benefit from having trees in an urban area. As we look at the United States as a whole, the darker the green color, the more runoff that's been avoided thanks to having trees. And, you know, this is maybe somewhat predictable, right? Where do we have a lot of trees? Well, certainly on the East Coast, up into New England, down in the Gulf states as well, typically have a lot of trees. And then also up in the Pacific Northwest. So, yeah, they definitely help, right? They're having the trees around. In the Great Plains, we typically don't have as many trees. So we see that the runoff avoided by trees because simply we don't have them there. Uh, is a little less, right, obviously. Air pollution, though, absorbed by trees, so the darker the blue, uh, the more pollution that's being absorbed just by having trees around. And again, you can see that that darker blue color is corresponding to where we have more trees, right? But especially in California and on the Pacific Northwest, look at how much that just having the trees around helps to purify our air, right? And this is carbon pollution removed by trees and 1,000 tons of CO2 per year, and again, it depends on where you have the trees. For instance, in West Texas, not that many trees, right? Very open area. Same story up in Kansas and uh, Nebraska, kind of those Great Plains states, not as many trees. So we're not absorbing as much pollution. But even in California, right, we have some polluted air. Not going to lie. It happens, right? We have a lot of people here, a lot of cars, and we have pollution. So just having the trees around can really help to cut down not only on the amount of air pollution, but also on the amount of carbon that we're able to remove from the atmosphere. And so that's the focus this week is on urban forestry. Talk to an expert who spent a lot of time in Sacramento and is familiar with Northern California and the importance of trees. And it goes beyond just pollution, but also there's a socioeconomic uh, part to it. it. It's just a very interesting conversation. I want you to check it out. My background's really as an urban ecologist. So I study the relationship between um, the way our cities are built 
the kind of uh, trees and green spaces in our cities, things that have led to the certain distribution and quality of green spaces in our cities, and the way that changing weather and climate really affects the quality of life for the communities in our cities based on that kind of city form and distribution of green space. Dr. Vivek Shandas is a professor of climate adaptation at Portland State University, focusing on urban forestry. And he's no stranger to the city of trees. I've actually not only spent a lot of time in Sacramento, I've also uh, worked with several tree-related organizations in Sacramento, including California Relief, Sacramento Tree Foundation, um, even Davis Trees to a certain extent, nearby neighbor. Close your eyes and think about trees. What comes to mind? Probably palm trees along the Pacific coast or the evergreen forests of the Sierra Nevada. But trees in and around urban areas are just as important for many reasons. So trees are really important in urban areas for really comes down to three reasons. The first is just really human health and well-being. Trees shade the community. Sacramento can get really hot in the summer, as we all know. And having those large elm trees, for example, are really helpful to be able to provide shade to that local community. And the second thing that trees provide is really a lot of social health and well-being. So we actually see places that have more trees, people are more connected, they trust one another a bit more, they're working together a lot more, and so that social side really plays out pretty importantly in places that have a lot of trees. And the third is really when we start thinking about trees and cities, it brings up questions of equity and distributional, uh, distributional equity primarily. South Sacramento has far fewer trees than other parts of Sacramento, for example. Um, and in the work that I've done with Sacramento Tree Foundation and other local organizations, there have been a lot of efforts to try to right some of those past wrongs uh, by creating programs that are specific to South Sacramento culturally. Inequity in trees and green spaces might not be something we often think about. Trees are just there, right? Well, not necessarily. We've really tried to unpack what are the reasons for that, and we've really narrowed it down to two fundamental reasons. One is kind of historic planning processes, and that comes down to how neighborhoods were segregated from starting, you know, early 19th century through uh, acts like the Homeowners Loan Corporation and residential segregation. And those areas were disinvested in, meaning they didn't, um, they didn't get the trees, the parks, the green spaces more generally. And in fact, um, got a lot more of the big box stores, got a lot more of the freeway, you know, freeways, got more of the industrial facilities, which seals up the ground and really makes it hard to get a tree in there. You're gonna have to cut concrete out if you wanna get a tree into that spot. And that's a costly and sometimes uh, politically challenging uh, activity to take on. And the second quick reason is simply that we have a system that's been set up for so many decades where we are essentially trying to take care of the trees that we have. So most of urban forestry is, is has been, recent in recent history, focusing on places that have trees. And so we have to maintain those trees, we have to care for them, which again continues to um, kind of marginalize those communities that don't have trees. And despite never before seen investment in urban forestry as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, it's not as easy as just showing up and putting a tree in the ground. Um, we can't necessarily just go to a community that doesn't have a lot of trees and start planting a bunch of trees. We've seen that actually backfire in many ways. A lot of investment, money, water is put into these trees and the community didn't ask for them and they go in and uh, either take the trees out or uh, find a way to not take care of them in any way. And so what we really need to be doing at the core here is trying to engage these communities directly in understanding what their needs are and finding out how these trees could help address those needs. If a community is talking about hotter summers and how they're really having trouble coping, we could talk about what a west-facing tree or a south-facing tree around their residence might actually do for cooling the temperatures in and around their homes. So it's meeting what I like to think about as multi-solving. Yet, as we all know, trees need water. And in a state like California, which suffers from highly variable climate and extended periods of drought, can we afford more trees from a water budget perspective? The idea of planting a tree will immediately bring up like, how do we go about watering it when we are really constrained with water? 
Um, a few ideas that have really been emerging is drought tolerant trees. In the past, we've gone about planting the prettiest tree. They've been often in cities, like aesthetic quality. Like we planted a tree because it's uh, really handsome. We need to be thinking about the right tree in the right place. And so largely what that's about is as we recognize that climate at shifts in climate and uh, more extreme weather events are going to stress our water systems, we're going to have to start thinking first and foremost about how we're really selecting the trees that will do well in a, in a drought condition, in times when they don't have a lot of water. And that doesn't just mean planting cactuses. It really doesn't. There are a lot of trees that have plenty of uh, evolutionary and natural history that allow them to really take in the water when it is coming in and be able to send deep roots down to be able to uh, get access to that water that often infiltrates deeper down. A city like Sacramento is familiar with trees. After all, we are the city of trees. But urban forestry isn't just a West Coast thing. Every city can benefit from having the right trees in the right places. I'm really watching Philadelphia right now. They're doing some really interesting uh, movements. And I say that in part because not only do, are they hiring, kind of, are they growing their urban forestry division, but they're finding multiple ways to get green spaces into cities. And that's really what we need to be doing. Trees are a great um, option, though we also need to be thinking simultaneously about um, about green roofs, we need to be thinking about green walls, we need to be thinking about bioswales, like these stormwater uh, systems that could collect the rainwater when it's coming down and you can get green space in those bioswales as opposed to moving the water directly into a pipe and out of sight, out of mind. We want to try to actually find different ways for bringing green space, even if it's a micro green space. Ultimately, trees have been around forever. We know their importance to our local and global ecosystem. So why the renewed interest in urban forestry right now? It seems like trees are at the intersection of multiple things. We have $1.5 billion going into urban community forestry from the feds. Nothing like this has happened before. And so the question of why now, and it really comes down to an intersection of uh, the climate crisis, of all the challenges we're seeing in cities and communities with, with flooding, with heat waves, and it comes down to uh, historic injustices that have been in place for a very long time and trying to find ways to right those past wrongs. And I know Sacramento is uh, gonna be front and center with this.